Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. All right, the BS of the UNHRC is in full swing at the terror lovers capital of the world, Geneva, Switzerland. I just had a hearty laugh when I heard the statement made by the UNHRC High Commissioner, Michelle Bashley. Uh, she's having an issue with military personnel being in public service. Why, madame? Are you so against our military getting the job done? A 30-year-old war? One. Asked to assist, assist in the COVID operation? Excelled it. Asked to execute the vaccination program? World class. Read then about the madam. Now, former Army Commander Dairat Naika had a stellar response to this nonsense statement. It's absolute uh, rubbish and from my uh, reaction is that it's absolute right rubbish. Uh, this is um, none of these people because they don't know what violations of human rights actually. The operations that we plan, the humanitarian operations we plan, they can come and study how to do operations. It is being categorized. In fact, they're studying, right? Yeah. Uh, other countries actually Other countries it. studying and uh, one of the American reports says one of the top universities from USA have given a report to the White House saying that this is the best operation concept uh, implemented uh, in the recent past in the contemporary history and this and the rehabilitation program so all these have given uh, the, even the UN certain organizations have recognized them as top uh, operational uh, strategies well, Sri Lanka was taken up as the second item on the UNHRC agenda and, and she was completely going on and on and on about, you know, how things were not done according to the way she wanted and the UNHRC wanted for past 13 years. As you know, it's a useless effort that they've, they've undergone wasting money and all that. I'm not going to show, uh, show you the, the statements made by the uh, UNHRC High Commission because it's a waste of everybody's time. But here's the response from our government. We are convinced that there are serious anomalies and weaknesses in the report presented to this council by the High Commissioner. The fundamental deficiency is its intolerably intrusive character, impinging as it does on core functions and responsibilities of organs of the Sri Lankan state overwhelmingly mandated by the people of our country at three successive elections. There is as well a clearly discernible element of discrimination in that the council would certainly not take it upon itself to embark on a similar inquisitorial procedure in respect of other member states. This in itself Mr. President, strikes at the very root of the foundations of the United Nations system. The issue of uniformity and consistency of standards applied by the High Commissioner to member states, irrespective of their size and influence, and in steadfast conformity with the essential principle relating to the sovereign equality of all members of the United Nations fraternity, is cynically transgressed in several portions of this report. The government of Sri Lanka is firmly resolved to maintain the security and stability that we have restored for our people and ensure sustainable progress in an equitable manner. My country, Mr. President, reaches out to the international community with a sincere exhortation to join us as partners on a footing of equality and mutual respect to face the challenges ahead. In order to uh, get more uh, information about this entire session, uh, Dhani Dutanamasam has that story. The UNHRC was clearly divided when considering the views expressed by member nations on the High Commissioner's report and the situation in Sri Lanka. Seventeen statements were made during the interactive session which was inclusive of the High Commissioner's speech and Foreign Minister G.L. Pierce's address to the Council as the concerned nation. A statement on behalf of the co-group was made by Rita French, United Kingdom's Global Ambassador for Human Rights and Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Interestingly, most thoughts expressed by countries in Europe were in concert. The EU acknowledges the proposed, though limited, reform of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and urges further efforts to bring it in line with international standards. 
more comprehensive reforms are urgently needed to bring counterterrorism legislation in line with international standards. We call upon Sri Lanka to cooperate fully and effectively with the High Commissioner and the UN institutions. Benelux countries encourage the Sri Lankan government to fully cooperate with our CHR. Two key highlights from the session were the addresses made by the delegate of India and Philippines. India's permanent representative called on Sri Lanka to address the legitimate aspirations of the Tamil community in Sri Lanka. An important stance was taken up by the delegate of Philippines, put into question the exorbitant funds allocated for the accountability project prescribed by Resolution 46-1 to Sri Lanka alone. We are not convinced that OHCHR has the mandate and capacity to carry out this so-called project. The exorbitant cost of the mandate in the region of $3 million, mainly for the salaries of 12 new P-level UN staff for one year, has little to offer to concrete programs. The session is to continue tomorrow as well. I'm Danny Dittanamas, I'm reporting there. Now listen, let's ask the obvious question. What tangible things have the UNHRC managed to achieve in the past 13 years concerning Sri Lanka, or, or better yet, worldwide? Have they managed to bring justice to anyone, at least one nation, one society, or better yet, just one single person? Right now, there's a war in Ukraine. Has the United Nations been able to stop it? This organization was designed to avert situations like that. You know, the very reason they were created after World War II. Like the UN, the rest of the bodies are completely failing and never do they have the ability right now to bring any kind of tangible solutions to the rest of the world. Now, last year alone, the UNHRC's budget was 116.4 million US dollars. What the heck did they do with that money? Well, perhaps they gave lavish dinners to the LTT sympathizers who visited them during the session under the guise of resource personnel. Joining me now to discuss more on this is other than a contributor and political analyst, Malinda Sinibratna. Thank you very much, Malinda. I appreciate your time. Uh, well, Malinda, the UNHRC, after 13 years, has failed to deliver any relevance for the Tamil people in Sri Lanka since the end of the conflict. All what they've done thus far is to create a bad image for Sri Lanka, a nation that was doing it utmost best to recover from a conflict. I mean, What's the purpose of having these sessions over and over again when nothing credible occurs? Uh, Mahesh, uh, it's like this, well, delivering anything credible to the Tamil people or anyone else is not the UN's business, it's uh, our business. If it's anything to do with any of our citizens, regardless of whether single is Tamil or whatever, that is our business. The UN can, uh, I mean, it's mandated, mandated to support member states in delivering the, uh, you know, what is good and wholesome and so on. Uh, well, the the thing is, the United Nations. Of course, there are organisations that, that that do a lot of good work, but when you take the human rights outfit uh, and even the General Assembly and the Security Council. Uh, it operates like a cartel, you know, some, uh, there's a friend of mine who calls it the United Mafia, it's not the United Nations, it's not UN, it's UM. So uh, it becomes a kind of a tool for various uh, big name nations uh, or people, the powerful nations with bucks and guns uh, to push their agendas through. They will uh, censure governments that they dislike, they will protect those, they, those who are friendly to them. Uh, and uh, that has been the case of the United Nations when it comes to uh, a lot of international conflicts uh, and uh, even uh, civil situations like we had terrorism. It's about who is my friend and who is not. So the, in that sense, uh, we, we think that you know we all have one vote, uh, equal vote uh, in the in the general assembly, and therefore it's very democratic. But there's a lot of arm twisting happening, and those who have the bucks uh, uh, make the rules about uh, how to behave, how not to behave, and so on. So it has not been useful to Sri Lanka, except in certain instances where uh, you know. They have been pushing governments, like the Sri Lankan government, to do certain kinds of things, which are which are which are not really bad. I mean, we need to get our act together also. But underlying it and what frames that that intervention is very pernicious, and that is not useful. I think uh, Professor G. L. Pires, uh, in his submissions, um, was very clear about how 
the resolutions on Sri Lanka go against the grain of the mandate of the of the Human Rights Council and the Commission. So uh, it's not a very happy situation for countries like Sri Lanka. Alinda, you are, are spot on. Now, do you think Sri Lanka should continue to entertain this process because it's evident that our voice is neglected, stifled, and in return, the UNHRC gives more prominence to the voice of the LTT and their sympathizers. Why continue with this charade? I, I don't think that the, it's like this. We, we see it as our, our protagonist has been the, the, you know, the other protagonist has been the LTT and the terrorist outfits and that, that kind of, uh, you know, those kinds of uh, processes. So we see them as uh, being supportive of the LTT, but that is, I mean, I don't think they are the, they, they would care either way regarding the LTT. What, uh, what matters is if they can use the LTT voice or, you know, the cardinal's voice, for example, if, if whatever is useful to push their agenda uh, uh, forward. And uh, with Sri Lanka, we are still a member state and uh, we can't really get out of that uh, without uh, uh, incurring the wrath of uh, a lot of these nations and uh, we are not a superpower, we don't have veto powers. So, but then we should uh, do two things, I think. One is we need to be honest and I think the, the government, this government at least, the previous government actually compromised our sovereignty through resolution 30 slash 1 by co-sponsoring it. We have to state our case clearly concisely and with facts and figures. That I think was done and has been done. Whether truth, justice and uh, you know, fair play count in these things is of course another matter. We know that that's not true. I mean, how many resolutions have you got against Israel? How many resolutions? Uh, I mean, where, when did the, the uh, human rights uh, bosses uh, censure uh, the United States of America? When did they take a stand on NATO? And, uh, and how NATO has been operating all over the world, I mean, supporting the United States uh, military activities. Uh, and but they, they are very, very worried about the Ukraine. So it's, it's all politics. Whether we can get out of it, well, I, do, I don't think that I mean, an isolationist kind of position helps. It's not like we are independent, we are financially secure. Uh, we have a very strong, robust economy. We don't, we don't have those luxuries. If we did, then, then certainly yes. But even countries like China, um, they, they, they play it. I mean, there's nothing to get, uh, to lose or win here. So we might as well be there because the you know, UN system has other, as I mentioned, other uh, entities which do a lot of good work. Uh, of course, the human rights is, is like toilet wash, you know, we have to admit that. We have to say it in, one, in, in, in diplomatic terms. I can call it to toilet wash. Uh, Professor G. L. Pires can say, well, uh, this goes uh, counter to the mandate of the body. But it's the same truth, we are saying it in different ways. Well, uh, we need to engage in, a, in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way, I think, and I think the, uh, there's only so much you can do, but the much that has to be done has to be done. Absolutely true. Very much agree with you. Um, thank you very much, Marlene Desen, Virat Nadu, the a contributor and political analyst, uh, for speaking to me right here on State of the Nation. We will take a short commercial break. When we return, will Putin's war against Ukraine hammer our oil prices in Sri Lanka? Stick around. <laughs>